Okay, ladies and gentlemen, today we are living in times of confusion, especially for Catholics. They no longer, we no longer know what to believe, or if we do, we don't know why we believe it. So uh, this video is basically a little my recommendations of a few books and resources to help you know your faith, why you believe it, how to defend it, how to uh, explain it to others. Um, and uh, above all, it's for yourself, for your own knowledge. Uh, so you enlighten yourself because a lot of times we do not no longer hear the truth, the truth preached to us from the pulpits or even from the statements of uh, bishops, unfortunately, and even popes. So, uh, let us, uh, oh, this is basically a few books. You can see them over here. I'm going to be I'm not reviewing the books, just giving you resources, easy to get, easy to get, uh, to study, very useful. I mean, there's so much more, but these are, I would consider the basics. So we will start with what St. Paul says, because he tells us in Ephesians chapter four, to be careful, to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace, one body and one spirit as you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one church, one kingdom of Christ, one body of Christ. And he continues that he says, henceforth, so from now on, henceforth, we are no more, we be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about by, about, with every wind of doctrine, by the wickedness of men, by cunning craftiness, by which they lie in wait to deceive. By doing the truth in charity, we, we may be in all things, grow up in him who is at the head, even Christ. So we no longer be wanna, oh, today they're telling us, this is okay. Yesterday it was a sin. Now it's not a sin. Uh, oh, it was. We don't. There is but one faith, and that faith does not change. It is the deposit of faith, which comes to us from the apostles, and we were, are not to be tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine by deceivers and destroyers of the faith. So Saint Paul continues uh, in his Galatians chapter one. He says, and he's wondering. He says, you know, I wonder that you. You are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. There isn't a gospel from a thousand years ago and a gospel from a hundred years ago and a gospel for modern man or a gospel for the Amazon. None of that stuff. There is but one gospel. So he was warning them. He's, he's wondering why they went to another gospel, which is not another only which is not another only there are some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of christ because there's only one gospel they pervert the gospel of christ but though we so even an apostle though we an apostle chosen by god himself though we or an angel from heaven preach a gospel to you besides that which you have we have preached to you let him be anathema let him be damned, let him be condemned. As we have said, as we said before, so now I, I say again, if anyone, anyone, okay, if anyone uh, preach to you a gospel besides that which you have received, let him be anathema. For do I now suppose, uh, persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? If I seek to please men, if I yet pleased men, I should not be a servant of Christ. So we shouldn't be worried about what is going to the world going to think? What is going to be the media going to believe? Oh, it, it doesn't look good. We don't care. We care about the gospel, what Christ taught us, what came to us from the apostles. One, the same gospel from 1,000, from 1,500, from 1,900, from 2,000 years ago, unchanged. St. Paul continues, we're not to please the world, we please God. He says, for I give you un to understand, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. So it's not a human invention. 
for neither did I receive it or neither did I receive it of man, nor did I learn it, but by the revelation of Christ. So, um, of course, there are other sources and resources. Um, so, but let's get going because we start off with God himself telling us there people can pervert the gospel, pervert the truth, pervert the deposit of the faith. And even if an angel from heaven himself comes and tells us some, to believe something different, he will say, well, you know, a uh, hundred years ago, uh, God uh, demanded and commanded the, the death penalty, but now it's immoral. We know this is a perversion of the gospel of Christ, and we will reject it even if an angel from heaven himself tells us to do so, to tells us this new gospel or new understanding. All right? So we'll start off your resources. What do I need? Well, number one, you need the inspired, inerrant, infallible word of God, as the church has always taught. The Holy Scriptures are inerrant. They do not contain error, at least in their original manuscripts. Various translations will might have different uh, errors, but start off with a good one, the Dewey Reims version. This is the, actually a revision of the Dewey Reims version by Bishop Shalinor. Shal Shalinor. But anyways, it's a revision. It's not the original. If you look behind me there, see my finger, three back black books. That is actually the original Dewey Reims English translations of St. Jerome's um, Vulgate. It's three volumes printed. Uh, volume one was the, uh, there's, vo there's the one for the vo Old Tes New Testament and two volumes for the Old Testament. They contain a lot of annotations and footnotes and explanations, which unfortunately are not in the, or in the revised version. Um, so if you can grab the hold of the original, that's great. Uh, there's actually a, somebody online here. Uh, he prints a, a modern uh, English, um, spelling of the same um, original Dewey Reams. Uh, it's kind of expensive, but you can always grab it. But of course, uh, you know, even that, even this one is better than 99.9% .9 of modern translations because the Latin Vulgate is the official Bible of the church. It doesn't have political correctness and none of that stuff happening. So after the scriptures, what do we have? Books, which were almost considered scripture in the old age, early church, the apostolic fathers. Apostolic fathers, these were the successors of the apostles immediately. And they contain, you read the, and think, wow, my God, they, this is, this is, this is, this is the Catholicism I know. There's talking about fasting Wednesdays and Fridays for the, the, the betrayal of Christ on Wednesday and the crucifixion on Friday. There's the teaching about the bishop being the, the high priest uh, the Eucharistic liturgy being the sacrifice predicted by Malachi. Uh, be, there is the, uh, the Eucharist being the very same self, same flesh of Christ and blood of Christ. And there are, were heretics who refused to admit that it is truly the very body blood of Jesus Christ himself. So it is a, a treasure, especially there's the uh, epistles of St. Ignatius of Antioch and St. Clement of Rome and St. Polycarp. So... You can find a lot of the writings online. You can grab a book. Uh, I'll leave that up to you. Another great resource uh, for understanding as well is the history of the church by Eusebius, Patriarch of Constantinople. In it, you'll find a lot of um, material from a non-existent, like um manuscripts i mean it has a lot of stuff which is still available and there's a lot of stuff which has disappeared over time um even there's um like a discussion of the genealogy of christ there you know there are two geneal genealogies and why the discrepancy and actually according to saint eusebius uh, from uh, earlier records relatives of jesus christ himself explain the discrepancies it's not really a discrepancy, but they explain why they are different. So it's great, including their quotes from St. Irenaeus, talking about there's only four Gospels and uh, various histories of the Apostles, including St. John, the Apostle, the beloved Apostle, which, of course, portrayed in modern times as this kind of effeminate, weak love disciple when he was really a, one of John and James were the sons of thunder. 
as uh, scripture calls them, as I believe. And he was very, very, very tough against heresy and heretics. There's stories of him just coming across, being in the same room of a heretic. He would just leave. He would storm out. He would did not bear the company of those who defiled and deceived uh, the faithful or invented new novel, new doctrines. So he was no St. John, the beloved disciple. No, he was a son of thunder. He was a true apostle of Christ. Okay, so that's for that. So we got scripture and the earliest church history so people understand where things come from. Now, after that, we go into the catechisms. Actually, even before the catechisms, another great resource is this free volume set of the Faith of the Early Fathers. So Faith of the Early Fathers, uh, let's give me a second here. Yeah, for the Faith of the Early Fathers, um, they contain the various doctrines. So you can actually look in the back, you can find, I don't know, um, Oops, I don't know if you can see it. One God or the um, religion and cult uh, tradition. And they have um, resources and you can look at, okay, what is, you know, St. Hippolytus of Rome? What did he say? And so you have all the resources of all the ancient fathers. So volume one starts off with the pre-Nicene, the the pre the Council of Nicaea, before Nice Nicaea. All the fathers and references. So you can read and say, like, oh, where do we believe this? And you look at it. Oh, let's see the fathers. What do they say? Oh, and it gives you the reference where it comes from if you want to explore it more off, more deeply. So that's volume one. Volume two starts after the Council of Nicaea Kings until St. August, uh, until... Um, no, until... Where is it? Anyways, yeah, some post-Nicene writings, and then volume three is St. Augustine up to the end of the patristics, so the fathers of the church period. So all three volumes, again, excellent for yourself, for others. Uh, somebody says, oh, you know, that's an invention of the medieval times. The Middle Ages, you know, the church invented stuff. You say, okay, well, let's have a look here. Knowing you're really from the year 200, father so-and-so, bishop so-and-so taught that. So we have the faith, which comes to us from the apostles. It doesn't change. Um, now, we come to the, actually, the, uh, before that, there's another resource for knowledge, for doctrine, is the liturgy. The liturgy, the church tries always taught, is a source of knowledge, of faith. So I would suggest the ancient Roman rite, pre-1955, before the tinkering of the Holy Week by Pope Pius XII. So there's good um, uh, missiles, there's the Father of Sons, and then there's one which I haven't seen, but apparently it's good, the, um, what's it called? I'll put a link to it. There's a couple of pre-1955 full missiles. You have the every prayer for every day of the year, the readings, the... So it's really, really um, useful because how you pray is how you believe. Uh, again, re read the liturgies of the other churches. Uh, this is uh, from the Coptic, the Coptic uh, Church, uh, actually the Coptic Catholic Church. Uh, so this is their uh, liturgy of Saint Basil the Great, according to the Coptic tradition, the Coptic rites. So it's in Arabic here, but. Um, and that's the basic one. You can probably find online a more fuller version. This is for the Byzantine one, the St. John Chrysostom, Divine Liturgy. So again, if you compare liturgies, uh, you can look at the Ethiopic one, the uh, Armenian one, because they convey the faith. Now, let's go into more kind of a point-by-point -point, uh, thing. Catechism of the Council of Trent. Number one catechism, better than... Uh, all of them. Well, yes. <laughs> so anyways, um, Catechism Counselor, or by Pius V, uh, I think Robert Bellarmine uh, authored it, I believe. So it has, it's, if you looked at the new catechism where it has like the creed and the commandments and the Our Father, it, it's based on the Catechism of the Council of Trent. Even Pope John Paul II himself and the introduction to the 
New Catechism states the exact same fact. So this one, you don't have to worry about uh, being... Um, everything is stated clearly. There is no hedging of anything. Everything is stated clearly, and there's refer biblical references, references to the fathers. So it's excellent, excellent, excellent. Because, I mean, out of everything, if you just memorize one of these books or you know exactly what's in it, and the Catechism of the Council of Trent, that's it. That's all you need to know, really. Even more important than reading the Bible, in a sense, because this puts everything in context and tells you everything, where everything comes from, categorizes everything, so you know your faith. Um, and then you can always use a scripture to expand on it. But this is excellent. After that, you get the Catechism of St. Pius X. Again, this is a good one. I haven't gone through this version yet. I mean, it's the same version, but this book, this printing has all the, and the, the difference with this catechism, it has a question answer format. Let's see if you can see it on the screen here. Anyways, question and answer format. So, you know, there's a question what, in what um, does confession of sin consist? And then there's the answer. And in this version, actually, there is as well the encyclical of Pope Pius X against modernism, which is running rampant. And after that, there is the new catechism of the Catholic Church under Pope John Paul II. And unfortunately, Pope Francis Jorge Bergoglio decided to change one of the articles in it because in it, it clearly states the governments have the right and sometimes even the duty of imposing the death penalty. But it does suggest that if bloodless means are possible, that they should refrain from capital punishment. Of course, Jorge, with a new gospel, tells us that it is immoral. It is against the gospels, which of course it isn't. So uh, it's good. Uh, the good thing with this, it is kind of wordy. That's the bad thing with this. It's kind of like Vatican II documents. Look, lots of it's wordy. That's all I can say. It's wordy, um, but it is. Uh, I mean, it's always good to have. Um, the other thing is, it deals with certain modern problems which didn't exist in the 16th century, like I don't know, artificial uh, insemination. Um, in vitro fertilization, certain sins which didn't exist in the past. Um, a really good companion, I would really highly recommend to get this if you're getting the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Is, it's even bigger than the Catechism, you can tell. So, yeah. It is actually, it's quite big. It's like a thousand pages. Uh, this has all, every single footnote, every single uh, reference of the Catechism in full. So they tell you the reference, and then they give you the quote in full. So it is really nice as um, for a study help if you so desire to go more deeply into it. All right. Let's, and in addition to the catechism, this is another good one. The sources of Catholic dogma. Where do these things come from? So uh, it's called the De Denzinger. So this is a source of Catholic dogma. Uh, so this is a really good uh, book to as well to have in your library for study. Now, we're almost done. It's kind of a short video, but uh, these are a treasure, especially for priests or bishops who um, seem to put Vatican II, which is a mere pastoral council, which condemned no error, which proclaimed no doctrine, um, above 20 other ecumenic, ecumenical councils which actually taught the faith. Now, this is actually volumes one and two of every, all the decrees of all the ecumenical councils from Nicaea to Vatican II. So this has usually the text in Greek and Latin, if it so applies, and the English translation. So Greek and Latin English translation of all the councils. So it is really, really valuable. And then you can see, because then as um, I think Cardinal Ratzinger said, don't think of Vatican II as a new beginning or of a super council. 
It's actually the least of the least, honestly, uh, because it defined nothing and condemned nothing. So, <laughs> so really, it's a you know. Um, so yeah, that's a, a really valuable resource to have, and uh, I'll give you one little thing, and it just shows you the importance of it. So for the Second Council of Nicaea, there is here. I bookmarked it, marked it, I guess, when I was reading it uh, a few years back. So in it, it states, therefore, and that was during the iconoclastic heresy where people tried to destroy icons and images. So it here says, uh, but it's not specifically uh, about that. So it says, therefore, all those who, uh, let's see here. That's, uh, okay, let, let all, therefore, let all those who dare think to teach anything different or who follow the, uh, the accursed heretics in rejecting ecclesiastical traditions or who deny or who, who desire uh, innovations or who uh, spurn anything entrusted in the church or who devise uh, innovations or who spurn anything in the church uh, in whom um, let's see here So basically, they are condemning anybody who try to devise innovations or who reject ecclesiastical traditions, not just dogmas, even traditions, as heretics. And uh, it says here, actually, in one of the canon uh, number, let's see here, actually, end of number three of the anathemas, so Vatican II had zero anathemas. In the end of canon number three, uh, on the anathema three, if anyone, so that includes anyone, uh, rejects the written or unwritten tradition of the church, let him be anathema. So ecclesiastical traditions, written or unwritten tradition, let him be anathema. And this is the teaching of the church, so it cannot be and these are anathemas. These are not suggestions. So volumes one and two, every single ecumenical council from the beginning to Vatican to the least of the least of the councils. So these are my suggestions for a good resources. Um, and of course, there's... I was going to go through different uh, Pope John Paul II demanding the adherence to the, the, the deposit of faith, actually in the introduction to the, the catechism. His catechism says, this is a presentation of the faith, of the, the deposit of faith, just presented in a new way. He even puts the quotes around it. But again, there is no innovation because the faith is the faith. It does not change. Uh, Pius X uh, condemned the ev evolution of dogmas, meaning a, a, a teaching changes its meaning over time, or and so forth. These are not. This is not Christianity. Christianity is one. It, the gospel is the same from the beginning up to now. Any deviation from the faith, as expressed in the canons and decrees of the all the ecumenical councils in the profession of faith like the nicene creed the apostles creed the athanasian and the creed of saint athanasius or the um, uh, the creed of the council of trent all four infallible declarations of faith which require adherence to written and unwritten traditions adherence to ecclesiastical traditions and rights uh, any defection from all four creeds is a defection from the faith. Um, and um, that's it. So we got to know what we believe and why we believe it. So number one, a good catechism. Council of Trent would be my suggestion. Um, and then all these rest add, add to the uh, penal, uh, to the uh, to your arsenal of, of, of understanding what you believe and why you believe it. And of course, traditional liturgy. 
the real Roman Rite, the so-called Latin Mass, the Byzantine Liturgy of St. John Chrysostom. Um, and if you can find a Catholic um, church which adheres to, say, the Armenian Rite or the uh, Coptic Rite or the Ethiopic Rite or even the East Rites from India, all are traditional rites which convey and pass on the one and only Catholic and Apostolic faith because how you pray is how you believe. You change the way you pray, you lose the faith period. So that's it for today. Hopefully this gives you some um, things or resources which will help you out. And um, that's it. Hope you enjoyed it.